Hello and welcome to Criminal Justice in a Nutshell. Today we're going to be talking about how probation developed. Okay, probation is cha tab two, chapter two for the Community Resources and Corrections. We're going to talk about probation and how things got about and how things went together. Okay, today is what we see in probation today is completely and totally different than the, what was evolved from way, way back when. Our first sign, okay, we believed or we saw that probation was a way to keep people out of jail. And it started out as a way to avoid conviction. You could pay a fee to the state with the promise that you would behave and that you offer good behavior. And as long as you had good behavior, they would let you stay free and they wouldn't put you into jail. Okay, and another program that they had prior to the 1830s was called late on file. It's where the judge would turn around and say, you know what, I'm going to give you a chance, I'm going to give you an opportunity, and I'm going to sit your file down over here, and we're just going to sit on it. And if you don't cause any problems, you don't get into trouble, you don't do anything wrong for 90 days, I'm just going to tear this up and we're going to throw it away. It avoids giving you the stigma of being a, considered a criminal or, or, or a bad person. Uh, this changed in 1830 with a court case called the Commonwealth versus Chase. And the Commonwealth versus Chase was heard by Judge Peter Oxenbridge. And Judge Peter Oxenbridge, this was the first case for a release on recognizance. Although it was illegal in Massachusetts at the time, if you were arrested and you were sent to stand before a judge, you were forced to be punished and you were sentenced. Well, Judge Oxenbridge said, you know what, I'm going to take this and I'm going to set it over here. I'm going to release you on your own recognizance. You pay the court a fee and you pay this bribe fee and as long as you don't get into trouble, I'm not going to bring this back up. But if you get into trouble, you violate the law, you commit another crime, I'm going to pick this file up and I'm going to charge you for both cases. And this was the foundation or the, the, the prelude for probation. Uh, in 1841, a man by the name of John Augustus. He was a abolitionist. He was also against, um, he was an abstinist. He was against alcohol. He was against drinking, but he was a cobbler. Uh, he was a shoemaker and he had a shoe factory in Boston. He went to court one day and there was this refuse, this drunk, and he was just absolutely horribly disgusting. And he told the judge, he said, Judge, release him into my care. I will teach him how to make shoes. I will make him a better individual. And once he did that, everything was great. So, and he started a trend. And this was all voluntary. And one of his students, uh, John Murray Spear, brought probation to New York, also in the 1840s. And he used university students and professors as a way to watch over and protect uh, those people that were in trouble for minor violations with the law to keep them out of jail and keep them from being punished. Okay, so he used these university students and professors as volunteers to be advocates of the poor and keep them out of jail. You know, because taking poor people, punishing them and putting them in jail is not beneficial to society it's not going to help anything it's just going to make things worse in 1878 boston decided that there the probation was a great program and it was something that that was beneficial to the state of massachusetts so they hired their first paid probation officer and what happened was this paid probation officer was also a police officer for the city of boston so if you got into trouble, the courts would say, I'm going to release you on probation, but you have to go and you have to deal with this police officer. This police officer would act like a big brother. But this led to corruption, and the police officer would abuse this probationer in order to make other arrests and to force him to, to turn on other people. So in 1881, they took the probation out of the police department and they put it with the prison system and probation officers were responsible and they answered to the police prison commissioner 
Okay. Eventually, there was a law that made police o illegal for police officers to become probation officers. And I remember when I was a probation officer down in Tom Green County for the Concha Valley uh, Community Corrections Department, uh, Community Supervision and Corrections Department. Uh, we had a guy that come on. He was a police officer, and he finished his bachelor's degree, and he wanted to become a probation officer. And he applied for the job, and they offered him the job. But in order to become a probation officer, he had to relinquish his T-close license. He could no longer be a police officer. He had to turn it in, and he could not become a cop because of this law back in 1881, or in the 1880s, that prohibited police officers from becoming probation officers. Matthew Davenport Hill was another guy. He was a contemporary to John Augustus, the father of probation, but he developed in probation in England. He should be getting as much credit as John Augustus, but he doesn't. Uh, John Augustus is the, the man, and when you see the question on the test, it says, who is the father of probation? The correct answer is going to be John Augustus. Okay. But he developed probation as a option for sentencing in England. Federal probation in the United States, we had a really hard time getting federal probation put together. None of the judges at the federal level wanted to participate in the proba probation program. There were 34 attempts to get probation put together in the federal government uh, between 1909 and 1925. Uh, and it just didn't work very well and they couldn't get it done. However, by 1940, probation was nationwide. You found probation in just about every state. You found it in, you know, in the federal government. In the state of Texas, probation was linked to the sheriff's department. You were placed on probation, you had to answer to the sheriff, and the sheriff had one officer uh, within the sheriff's department. His entire job was about dealing with those people on probation and supervising those people on probation. But you had to pay a fee. You had to pay this good behavior fee in order to be placed on probation and to stay on probation. And this exists today. To be on probation today, you have to pay $60 a month of your own money as a fee saying, yes, I'm going to be on my best behavior. Yes, I'm not going to commit any more crimes. Uh, please allow me to stay in the community. And that's where probation works. Um, 1984, Pro, fed, the federal parole system was completely abolished by the federal government and all they have now is probation. So if you were released from federal prison, you get out of prison and you go on probation and you stay on probation for the remainder of your time. Uh, we find that there's a lot of different programs today. Okay, if we return back to 1830s and back to Judge Oxenbridge, we see and we, we, we hear about the release on your own recognizance. Today's discussion, or this week's discussion, is um, should you need you to argue for or against the diversion and deferred adjudication programs as options for probationers. Let me explain those real quickly and briefly. The diversion program is something that takes place at the county or district attorney office. Okay, it's before it ever goes to court. And with a diversion program, you can set up a program and if it's answerable through the probation department, uh, you have to pay a fee up front here in Howard County. That fee is $720. You pay $720 up, fee, up front and you comply with their program for a year and what they'll, they'll just dismiss all the charges. The arrest will still be there, but... There will be no conviction. There will be, you know, it'll just say charges dropped, which seems like a really good idea. The other program is deferred adjudication. It's pretty much the same program, but it's at the judge level, not the county or district attorney level. And the judge will say, okay, uh, you're going to plead guilty. I am going to sentence you to 10 years in prison. Uh, however, I'm going to defer that. I'm going to place you on probation for two years, three years, four years, or whatever. Uh, and if you successfully complete this deferred adjudication program, uh, we will drop the charges. 
and there will be no final conviction. And I think that's what the difference is. With the diversion program, they just throw the entire case away and it never goes to court and there's no disposition, it's just gone. If it's a deferred adjudication, there is the case, the final district uh, says that it was deferred and then if you successfully complete the deferment, you know, it, it doesn't go away, it will always be there and it will say deferred adjudication. Okay. It's supposed to not hurt you, but in reality, even a deferred adjudication is gonna hurt you. If you want to ensure that nothing hurts you, you want a diversion program where it's before court, it's before trial, it's before any punishment um, is implemented by the courts. So what you need to do for your argument is you need to argue for or against abolishing this as a, as a possibility, as a way, as a punishment, as a way to address criminal behavior within the United States. Um, make sure that you back up your sources and back up your decision. You can't just say these people are slime balls and they shouldn't be given an opportunity to defer or to uh, or for a diversion program. I need you to back it up with the literature. Is this a successful program? Is it a program that works for everybody? Uh, make sure that you go ahead and and work through that uh, and cite your sources. Back your opinion up with facts from the literature. You can go to the Howard College Library, get into their databases and read other articles on this subject. You can read the textbook. Um, you can read other textbooks. You can even call the probation office and ask them what they think about the diversion program or the deferred adjudication program and see if this is something that they, they like and they want. Just make sure that you cite your sources uh, in text citations and a reference list at the end. Make sure that you respond to one of your classmates and then you reply to anybody that responded to you. Uh, in addition to the quiz this week, you also have a case study to do. The case study is on page 40 of your textbook, uh, and it's a diversion decision. You have two cases. You have two individuals, a uh, defendant Smith and a defendant Thompson. Uh, they have both committed different crimes. One uh, defendant Smith committed possession of ecstasy. They'll give you Smith's background. And... Defendant Thompson was a reckless injury to a person uh, You're going to make a decision and the decision that you're going to make on both of these cases is whether or not you should defer Whether or not you should use a diversion program deferred adjudication or not and then back up your decision and make sure that you have facts and Supporting evidence uh, from the case study to determine whether or not you should grant these make sure that you you defend your decision because if you just say no because I'm the probation officer and I say so you know you're not going to get a good grade on that so this has been John Fisher the development of probation criminal justice in a nutshell have a good day